Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Blake Bender. I work on the uh, Geo Native client at uh, VMware. And with me today is my colleague, Karen Miller. Hi, I also work for VMware, and uh, my association with Geode is as current uh, PMC chair, also committer. Um, I tend to do uh, mostly documentation work, but I have really enjoyed working on the uh, Node.js client, working with so, it. Thanks. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about JavaScript uh, and the uh, the Node.js client that we've developed for uh, GeoNative. There we go. Um, this presentation today, we're going to talk about the development process of the client because um, there were some interesting things that we learned there that uh, uh, end up being uh, applicable to uh, your application development when you're working in Node. Um, I'm going to discuss some considerations with respect to types. Um, and it is, in fact, really just one very important particular consideration with respect to types. but. Uh, uh, I'll discuss it when we get there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to set up your node development uh, for Apache Geode. Um, Karen's going to give a demo, um, show off the practical aspects of running an app, um, some basic app code, run it against your uh, cluster, and uh, then we'll we'll open it up for questions at the end. All right, just some basics of uh, Geo, and we assume most people on this track uh, know them. But uh, you know, Geo is a client-server architecture. Over here on the uh, right side, you see a, a server and a locator. A locator is a service that um, uh, is what you typically connect to. It tells you where your servers are, uh, and handles uh, communication details for you. Um, on the client side. If you're uh, uh, writing client applications, you have previously been limited to uh, Java, C++, or C Sharp. Uh, um, and now uh, with the uh, new component we've developed, you, you may also talk to um, Geo via uh, Node through our uh, Node extension. Um, in the middle of all this um, is the Geo Native client, um, and I just noticed that there's a there's a line there from Java to the Geo Native client that's not right. The Java app talks directly to to Geo, um, so we won't um, delve into that uh, today because that's the the traditional path to talk to Geo. Um, C plus plus C sharp and the Node app all go through this amorphous gray circle in the middle here called the Geo Native Client. Geo Native Client is written in C++ uh, with uh, C Sharp extensions on top of it. Um, and uh, our new component talks to it um, through a, a node extension that's also written in C++. Um, node Client is going to be donated soon now. Uh, currently, it is available from uh, VMware. Uh, for paying customers, but it will soon be uh, part of the Apache Geode project. Um, and uh, we're working through the process to get that um, contributed to the community. And uh, looking forward to um, that being generally available for everyone to download and play with and write cool node applications. Uh, ease of use. Uh, just want to call this one out, especially. Uh, we uh, had a very strong focus on making this as easy to use as possible. That's kind of the um, the mantra of JavaScript in general, right? It, it should just be um, very easy uh, and straightforward. And so we're we're, we're um, we simplified the API as much as we could uh, in JavaScript. Um, 
there were some challenges uh, porting the Geo Client API to Node.js um, that uh, I, would, I would be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, Geo Native Client is multi-threaded and synchronous API written in C++. Node.js is single-threaded, asynchronous, written in JavaScript. Um, yeah, it's a perfect fit, just a you know, square peg in a round hole. Um, uh, and uh, the development of it really, really felt like that, uh, actually. Uh, there was a, there were a lot of struggles. Um, the Node um, C++ extension framework was also brand new, and we would get new drops uh, weekly, bi-weekly even, um, that would fix bugs that we had found. <laughs> and so we would wait. You know, so everything was kind of moving at once. Um, we did eventually get there, uh, but um, there there were a couple of important uh, choices made in the in the design and development of it that that uh, bear mentioning here. Um, first thing with respect to um, the synchronous versus asynchronous nature of the APIs, um, we had to discuss promises. Um, that's promises are kind of the basic building blocks of your your function calls in 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 Node, um, they are asynchronous. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, for us, it didn't always make sense to use them, right? So, so rather than go all synchronous API or all asynchronous, we kind of shot down the middle and um, anything that is a non-trivial amount of work, anything that goes, um, that hits a network, uh, does IO, of any significance, um, et cetera, is a, an async call uh, returning a promise. Um, many of the methods in the Geo API are trivial uh, property getters and setters, um, various things like that. Um, any of those that don't really do any work are, are synchronous APIs. You just call and it's done and you can um, continue on with your work. Um, we have uh, made every effort to make it uh, very clear which is which in the API and the documentation. Um, you know, I think I think that uh, you'll find that it's it's pretty easy to follow. Uh, this is uh, the consideration with respect to types that I spoke of earlier. So when we when we looked at keys, uh, particularly numerical keys uh, for JavaScript, we discovered. Um, interesting that that we didn't know what kind of numbers uh, we had uh, JavaScript numbers are all doubles um, but that may or may not be your intent right if you if you uh, write you know uh, assign the value seven to a variable and then tell geode to uh, to uh, serialize that value um, it comes through as 7.0, and we don't have any way of knowing whether or not um, that was intended to be a, a double. Uh, this is particularly problematic for keys. Keys should never be um, floating point values. Um, it's just a, it's, a, it's a very bad idea for a number of reasons. Um, uh, so um, again, the compromise decision that we made was. Um, if a value is very, very close to a whole number uh, or is in fact a whole number and it is a key, uh, we will convert that to an integer value for you. So bottom line for, uh, for numeric keys is um, really we'd recommend you don't use them. Use strings or um, something else. Um, but if you're going to use uh, numeric keys, always, always use whole numbers. Um, floating point values um, are allowed. If you wanted to set a key to 3.5, for example, let's we'll store it as key 3.5. Um, but uh, it, it makes things very complicated. Uh, with respect to uh, values, there are not any uh, such limitations. Um, anything that's a value in JavaScript can be represented um, in the uh, geo layer. Uh, 
numbers, strings, uh, all of your standard primitives. Um, objects uh, get serialized from JSON. They get converted to a format called PDX. P stands for portable, so it's portable across uh, all of the languages that we support, uh, compatible with the Java client, the C++ client, C Sharp client. Uh, uh, PDX objects have um, two uh, attributes that are typically uh, used as keys. Well, not typically, but they're sometimes used interchangeably as keys. And one of them is definitely not a key um, class name in the Java world. It's just the Java class name. Uh, and that ends up working out most of the time, but is not, you know, 100% safe. Type IDs are guaranteed to be uh, unique. Um, and the reason that the, the, the class name issue is, is interesting and worth mentioning is because if you are serializing a JSON object to a PDX, it does not matter what kind of object you have. The class name is always some variation of the string JSON. Uh, and so um, it, it would behoove people not to pay attention to the class name for, for PDX objects in JavaScript. Um, ordinarily, it will never come up. Uh, that's something that uh, that our team has to deal with in the um, in the extension code. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So so JSON gets converted to PDX, uh, and it uh, it works back and forth across all of our clients, um, and uh, objects do just exactly what you would expect to do. Um, in your Java code. Um, all right, when you're setting up to develop for uh, Node and Geode, um, these are just a few things you'll need. You'll need a Geode or, or a Gemfire cluster. Gemfire is the proprietary name for, for Geode. Uh, and the Gfish utility, which comes with the install for uh, Geode. Uh, you'll need our Node.js extension client. And you need a minimum version of uh, 10.16.3 for Node.js. Um, another thing to consider when you're setting up is uh, which region type you'll uh, be using. Um, uh, and, I, and I wouldn't recommend you consider it for long. Uh, just choose a proxy region. Proxy region. Um, is uh, the only choice for a 12-factor app because otherwise you will have to um, carry around state uh, with your application. Um, proxy just ensures that all puts go straight through to the server and gets come from the server, nothing stored locally. It's all good. Um, caching proxy is another thing that's out there. Um, as you get deeper into development of a particular solution, you may uh, in some cases, discover that you need it. But right now, um, you know, if you're starting out, just choose proxy and uh, and move on. Uh, it's easy enough to change later. Um, current state of the API: um, gets and puts, uh, queries, uh, function execution is supported. Um, you know, that's the the bulk of the functionality in the in the native client. Um, there are development opportunities for implementing transactions and continuous queries, um, probably some more uh, esoteric features of Geode as well uh, uh, will be um, implemented in the future. All right, uh, I'm gonna hand off to Karen now. And Karen will run you through some practical use of the code. Thanks, Blake, for that handoff. Okay, so I'm going to attempt fate today by a, a little bit by uh, attempting to actually run an app uh, right here live. So let's take a look at. Um, at what apps uh, give us. Okay, so I would claim that uh, all, all of our apps 
have um, three distinct parts to them, and I'll go over each of these parts in turn. Um, the first part that any uh, Node app is going to have to have will set up the client side cache, and then we'll set up the communications um, to, to the running geode cluster. Once you've done that, then comes the second part, which is really the um, whatever it is that the app was intending to do. The app I'm going to present today does a series of CRUD operations. And the third part may be trivial, but uh, just a reminder that when the app is finishing and is, is going to exit, you really should close the client side cache. That doesn't change the servers and the cluster itself, but it does, um, it does uh, the proper thing with communication. Let me go through each of these three parts. And the um, first part was to set up the uh, client-side cache and the communications with the cluster. I've got this in um, five distinct, uh, I've, I'm showing it in five pieces. This particular code comes straight from my demo app. So this is the uh, actual code that you could use for um, setting up your uh, the setup in your own app. Okay, so each step. The first should be a familiar require statement, which will um, which will include the Node.js modules that you need and provide um, access to the uh, API. Second step uses a factory pattern to um, to set up what will be the or to um, to set up the cache. This particular cache factory also has a set of properties that will uh, enable logging for the cluster. Once we have that, we can create the cache and then set up the communication with the cluster using the uh, factory factory pattern again to for the pool. Um, of note here is that uh, when I do this demonstration, I'm going to be running the geode cluster on my local machine. And uh, that com the communication, I'm going to set up communication from the app to talk to, assuming that the locator is running on port 10337. So Eventually, when I start the cluster for you, you'll note that the the ports match, so the the locator will be listening there. Create the pool, and then the last step will be to create any uh, client side regions. Our region for this particular sample app is called test, and I'm using a proxy type region so that no data is stored within the, um, within the client cache. OK, so that's the setup and the actual code from the setup. Then the my application does a series of CRUD operations and uh, just a little bit extra for you. So it does a create operation. By pl and places a single entry into the region. Then it reads back that single entry, prints out the result. It does an update operation to change that single entry to have a different value. Then it does a delete operation and removes that single entry. The last two steps are not really the, you know, to show you CRUD operations, but to show you the uh, query functionality available with geode regions. Queries um, go through and use a language called OQL, which is an SQL-like language, and uh, it's very, very simple to use. I've, I've got the actual query here listed. Okay, so. 
those operations are exactly what the meat of the uh, of this the meat of what this app is going to do. I wanted to uh, just show you that the that the CRUD operations map to the how, how I wanted to show how the CRUD operations map to the API. So the create and update operations are both region put function, a read is a region get function, and a delete operation is a region remove function. Each of these um, functions returns a promise, so you'll see in the code the familiar await. We've done now, uh, talked about parts one and parts two, and part three is really just close the cache when the, uh, when the uh, app is done using it. So let's now switch over and see if I can actually do this demo. Okay, so I'm gonna put up a shell window for you, which looks really tiny. I wonder if I can turn off my video and that will help. Nope. Nope, when we practice this. Yeah. Short of my reading this session. Okay, that's a little better. We'll be fine. Okay. Okay, so I am going to run my JavaScript app. In order to do so, I need a geode cluster. Uh, I've already acquired, installed geode version 113. And what I need to do now is to start up my cluster. I happen to have this um, in a shell, shell script and it prints out a lot of information. I'm gonna talk you through as we start up a cluster. Okay, so here goes the geode cluster. The first thing it does is it starts a single locator. I'm hoping that you can see here at the bottom that it's starting up the locator and it's specifying to listen on port 10337, which matches what I did in my app. Once it does that, the second thing that this startup script is gonna do will be to configure using PDX for CL the PDX serialization. That's what we're doing now. Then the third thing this will do is to start a server. And I'm just having one server. This is a very simple example. I have no need for other servers. I'm only putting one item into my region. So now we're starting the servers, server. The fourth thing that will happen is to create the region on the servers. It will match my app and be called test, and it will happen to be a partitioned region, the choice of region we're not talking about here and now. Okay, so I should have, I, I should have now a cluster running with single ser server, single locator, and it's got its region. Um, I wanted to take a little bit of time here um, and just uh, show you that, um, show you because I think a lot of the audience uh, may not, uh, if you're familiar with JavaScript, but not so familiar with Geo, you might not know anything about our command line interface called, that we call Gfish. So I'm gonna run Gfish real quick here so that you can see um, some of the things we can do with Gfish for configuration of the pool. So I've brought up Gfish and to do anything significant, I need to actually connect myself with the pool. So I specify that I have my locator running on my machine uh, 
and the, the port there. So now that I'm connected, I can do things like list um, the JVMs, uh, the members of the cluster. I have a single locator, single server, um, or I can do, um, I can, um, I can print out details of our output details of the region. The size uh, here is something you might notice that um, there's nothing in the region, but right, of course, I, I haven't done anything yet. I haven't put anything, any entries in the region. So that's that. Okay, so I've shown you just barely enough. It's time to run the app. Well, first, actually, I need to um, uh, install the native client. So I'm sorry, install the, the node client. So there's a familiar npm install command. I had already acquired that. Now we have it. And the last thing is to actually run the app. So I haven't really done uh, very much. I've show I showed you the code and essentially I did an npm install and now I can run um, my app. This app is, not interactive with all the promises and such like that. It's um, it's exceedingly difficult to do a proper demo that would be interactive since all of the functions return again return promises. So this running this app, it's going to just blast all of what it does to the screen, and then we're going to go through uh, each of the items. Okay, so that went on to more than one screen. So we'll start at the top. I ran the app, and this app. Uh, prints out what it was doing. So it set up using the exact code I already showed uh, what was what was going on. Um, then it does the series of the four CRUD operations. The code is shown as output for this. Um, so the actual JavaScript code. So a create, op create operation returns promise um, and does a region.put function. So we've got the key and the value specified. Then this app reads back that single entry with using the key it just put in. It gets back as expected the value. An update operation is also a put. And here we are using that same entry, only we are changing the value. When we read that single entry back out again, we get expected changed value. Then we delete that one entry. So after that point, there should be nothing in the region. And when we read back out using that deleted key or deleted entry, we do get expected value of null. It wasn't there. Okay, so the last, the last set of um, uh, set of operations are to uh, are set up so I can do a simple query using the region query function from the API. I put a new entry into the region for you know just to show I I read it back out. That's not part of this, but I wanted to show that it was there, and the new entry is there. And then the code in the app to do to uh, query uh, for all values in this region returns back just the one because we only had one entry. And it's really that simple. Okay, so we've gone through um, this um, entire, entire app. And uh, let me bring back the slides for you. And I wanted to show you that um, you should be able to access now, right for now it's proprietary, but um, the, the proprietary reference documentation and the representation of the API that you can use to write your own apps. Um, and this example that I presented for you is a variation on um, one of the examples in uh, a repository up on GitHub.
So you could, uh, once you get this, you can see some examples. Thanks. And uh, if we have people here, we'd like to take questions from you. No questions? Well, that was easy. <laughs> give we will give people there. a little bit of time to <laughs> ask questions. Give them a couple minutes, sure. Oh, we have a question. The question Blake has, and I'll let you answer, are there plans to add support for other languages besides .NET and, dot and Node in the future? Uh, yes. Um, yes, I, I I'm, don't believe I'm tipping our hand too much to say that uh, .NET Core is the next thing that we wish to do. Um, Current .NET support is .NET Framework only, so it's Windows only and Microsoft tools, tool chain and stack. <clears throat> uh, .NET Core is next. Um, and we are uh, moving to a C language ABI uh, on the library so that uh, it will be uh, much, much easier to add uh, more languages in the future. Um, I mean, ideally, uh, I would like to see us get to a spot where um, people in the community that are interested in new languages can go grab the existing native client library and build their language support on that, top of that um, for for Go or Kotlin or what have you, you know, whatever they're interested in. Um, but we're certainly not there yet. Um, anyway, so so that's that's kind of what's on our on our. Um, longer term plan. Oh, I see another question. Will the Node.js client be donated to Apache Geode? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I believe that's in the deck. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, and now we have another another question. What's your favorite? What's language? your favorite language? Node.js, C plus plus, or C, or what? You go first, Blake. Uh, these days, I'm a big fan of Python. Uh, I do a lot of my <laughs> leisure time coding in Python. Have a lot of fun with it. Think it's just a it's just a joy to to use. I think I have C in my blood because of uh, using it for so long. So I can't, I can't wait to have the C bindings <laughs> available. I would love to have that. I know it makes it easy to translate, but that would be so great. We just have another minute or two, I think. 
Yeah. Um, for any any last minute questions, or we may end our end our talk a minute early. All right. Well, thanks hey. for coming and listening to us, everyone. Yeah. Hey, see y'all later. All right, see you.